Welcome to Fictional History 101. Last class we went over the origins of the One Year War and the roots of the Universal Century. In this class we'll be covering the start of the One Year War. While we wait for everyone to take their seats, let's quickly recap some things about the One Year War. The One Year War was fought between the space colonies of the Principality of Xeon, based out of Side 3 on the far side of the moon, and the Earth Federation government. This war had been brewing for a long time. The Earth Federation treated the space colonies unfairly, asking them to provide supplies for the Earth while keeping them under the watch of their military. These colonists were by and large made up from the lowest classes of the Earth, who were forcibly deported to the space colonies to serve as a labor force. When the colonies began to request independence after Zeon Daikun, the leader of Zeon, died, protests and riots broke out. The Earth Federation brutally put these riots down with the use of armed soldiers and even tanks in the streets. There was more than just the oppressive governance of the Earth Federation at play. The Zabi family, who took over after Zeon Daikun's sudden death, greatly promoted Zeon's ideas. They were especially focused on the concept of new types, or a new form of humanity that would occur once humans had moved into space. The Zabi family took this a step further, insinuating that not only should humanity move into space, but that those on Earth were inferior to those living in space. With the prejudice born from both ideology and actions from both sides, conditions were set for the One Year War to begin. Zeon had been secretly preparing for the war for some time. When they declared war against the Earth Federation at the beginning of UC-79, they formally adopted the name of the Principality of Zeon. Only three seconds after their declaration of war, they would begin their first attacks against the Earth Federation. Xeon mobile suits and ships launched surprise attacks against not only the Earth Federation fleets, but also against the colonies of Sides 1, 2, and 4. Horrifyingly, Xeon forces pumped poison gas into many colonies they attacked, massacring civilians and soldiers alike in the sealed environments. While it's debated how much knowledge of these gas attacks the common soldiers had, as some believe the gas was only meant to knock out garrison forces, it is indisputable that they happened. At the end of the first week of fighting, Zeon forces began Operation British. The goal of Operation British was to wipe out the military command of the Earth Federation government. This would not be easy as the Earth Federation forces had their headquarters in an underground base in South America. The forces Jabro was greatly protected against any form of attack both due to its position underground, as well as being deep in the jungles of South America, making its exact location nearly impossible to determine. On top of this, being underground meant it would be protected from most conventional weapons, such as nuclear weapons or other bombs. To counteract this, Zeon drafted Operation British. Its plan was to deorbit one of the space colonies and drop it onto Jabro to act as an enormous bomb. As the colonies could be as long as 36 kilometers, or 22 miles in length, and 6 kilometers in width, they would cause catastrophic damage if dropped onto the Earth. One of the depopulated colonies was selected from Side 2, and its orbit was altered with large engines attached to it. A Xeon fleet accompanied the colony in order to ensure it reached its destination. Federation forces under Admiral Tiananmen moved to attack the fleet, however they were repelled by the escort. In desperation, the Earth Federation launched nuclear weapons at the colony in order to divert or destroy it, however this didn't seem to stop it either. While entering Earth's atmosphere, the colony began to break apart, likely due to damage sustained both during re-entry and from the various efforts to stop it by the Earth Federation. Its course was altered, and rather than impacting Jabro, the colony struck Sydney instead. The entire city was completely destroyed, as was the surrounding area. All that was left was a 500 kilometer wide crater. The colony striking the Earth would have been equivalent to at least 60,000 megatons. To get a perspective on how powerful that is, the most powerful nuclear weapon detonated on Earth was roughly 50 megatons, while the ones used during World War II on Japan were about 15 to 20 kilotons. This would make the explosion from the colony drop roughly 3 million times more powerful than the weapons used on Japan. Although Operation British failed to destroy Jabro, the damage of a colony drop could not be ignored. The Principality of Zeon decided that they would try this tactic a second time, and move their forces towards Side 5, also known as Loom, in order to obtain another colony that would be suitable. There is some belief that Zeon may have leaked this information ahead of time in order to bait the Earth Federation into a decisive battle. 
This is supported by the fact there were many other sides that Xeon could have obtained a usable colony from. By leaking the information that Xeon planned to drop another colony, they'd be able to draw the Earth Federation towards them and into a massive engagement on their own terms. Dozel Zabi set off towards Side 5 with a massed fleet that comprised over half of Xeon's total fighting strength. However, General Revel and Admiral Tiananmen from the Earth Federation deployed their own fleets against Dozel. When the battle began, it seemed the Earth Federation fleet was in a position of superiority. They outnumbered the Xeon fleet roughly 3 to 1, and their ships had more powerful megaparticle cannons. Dozel's fleet was being torn apart before it could effectively engage the Federation fleet. The combined Xeon fleet seemed on the verge of retreat. However, the battle shifted dramatically when the mobile suit units of Xeon joined the battle. The mobile suit units were comprised of early-run Zakus and the mass-produced Zaku 2s. And this was the first battle in which mobile suits played such a prominent role. While mobile suits had seen some combat during the one-week battle, during ambushes of Federation fleets and attacks on colonies, the Battle of Loom was the first large-scale engagement they had been used in. With the mass dispersion of Minovsky particles, the mobile suits were able to approach the Federation fleet without detection. Once they had closed distance with the Federation forces, the larger weapons mounted on the battleships and cruisers had difficulty tracking the nimble Xeon mobile suits. Equipped with a variety of weapons, such as 120mm machine guns, 280mm bazookas, small nuclear warheads, and in at least one case, an oversized axe, the Xeon mobile suits proceeded to devastate the Federation fleet. The mobile suits were able to close distance with the capital ships of the Federation and target gun batteries and other vital parts of the ships, such as the bridge and engines, often crippling ships if they couldn't destroy them outright. General Rebel's flagship Anarchy was also destroyed during the battle, and he was taken captive by Xeon Special Forces. The battle was a decisive victory for the Xeon forces, and even more importantly, a daunting example of how powerful the newly developed mobile suit could be. However, no one escaped the battle unharmed. While the Federation fleet was devastated and the prominent General Rebel captured, Xeon's fleet had been badly depleted during the battle. This left them unable to immediately follow up on their success at the Battle of Loom. Worst of all, Side 5 was nearly entirely destroyed during the battle. While some colonies remained in the side, many colonies such as the Texas colony sustained severe damage during the battle and would be abandoned. The Battle of Loom would mark a point in which the Earth Federation's space operations would almost completely cease for the majority of the war. While Luna 2 was still in Earth Federation control, and Xeon was unable to mount an effective assault on the base, the majority of the Earth Federation's space forces were destroyed. Between the early series of battles and massacres, which would be later referred to as the One Week Battle, and the Battle of Loom itself, roughly 3 to 4 billion people had been killed. Almost a third of the human race had been massacred in only a few weeks. Galled by the horrors of battle unfolding before them, Side 6 declared its neutrality from the conflict. In addition, Von Braun's city, the first city built on the Earth side of the moon, declared its neutrality. Reeling from the devastation of the one-week battle, their loss at Loom, and the capture of General Revel, the Earth Federation was on the verge of surrender. The Earth Federation agreed to meet with the Principality of Xeon in Antarctica in order to negotiate a peace treaty. However, by the time negotiations had begun, General Revel had escaped captivity and brought back a message to the Earth Federation. Xeon was exhausted. He spoke to the Earth Federation about what he had seen during his time in Xeon custody. Xeon was low on soldiers, munitions, and at their limit of wartime production. While the Battle of Loom had seemed like a decisive victory for Xeon, it had cost them more than they'd previously let on. Reinvigorated by General Revel's discovery, the Earth Federation opted not to surrender and instead negotiated a treaty that established a ban on the use of nuclear weapons and colony drops, as well as establishing rules for the humane treatment of prisoners and ensuring the neutrality of several parties. This neutrality agreement extended to Side 6, Von Braun City on the Moon, as well as the other lunar cities, and the Jupiter Energy Fleet. There is some evidence that General Revel may have been allowed to escape by the Zabi family in order to keep the Earth Federation willing to fight so an invasion of the Earth could be justified. However, there's some conflict on that. Shortly after the Antarctic Treaty was drafted, Xeon began to mobilize its forces for an invasion of the Earth. This attack force would be comprised of both conventional forces as well as mobile suits designed for combat on Earth. This even included amphibious mobile suits for battling in Earth's oceans and rivers. 
the Earth attack force would be led by the youngest son of the Zabi family, Garma Zabi. At this time, the Earth Federation was convinced that wars were going to be dominated by mobile suits and began their own development project. They would name this plan Operation V. Beginning in March, Zeon began landing on Earth. Their Earth attack force was broken into five large groups, each tasked with a separate part of the Earth. These were Central Asia, North America, Australia, Northern Africa, and the Middle East. The landing operations entailed multiple drops of military forces. The initial operation focused on dropping mobile suits via large landing capsules. While mobile suits had been understood to be dangerous in space combat, the Earth Federation found them terrifying opponents on the ground. Standing nearly 60 feet tall and armed with powerful weapons such as their 120mm machine guns, the Zaku became a symbol of terror for Earth Federation soldiers. Not only were they powerfully armed, they were agile and often able to avoid the slower-moving tanks of the Earth Federation. In addition, Minofsky particles were as much of a problem for the Earth Federation on the ground as they had been in space. This left the Federation forces largely unable to detect Xeon mobile suits until they'd come within weapons range. While the initial force of mobile suits wasn't able to expand far past their landing area, they were able to repel early Federation counterattacks and establish a landing zone for further drops. This would allow Xeon to land larger weapons and vehicles, such as the Gao attack carrier, Yukon-class submarines, and Dobde-class battleships. Xeon intended to dominate the Earth Federation on land, sea, and air, and with these weapons they would be able to. Xeon didn't rest on its laurels. Taking advantage of the reeling Earth Federation army, the five groups began to capture Federation assets. Xeon forces were able to capture important areas such as Baikonur, Spaceport, California Base, which was the largest military base on Earth, and the resource-rich areas of Odessa. Between these three captured locations, Xeon would be in a much better position to continue the war. Baikonur's spaceport would allow the transport of materials back into orbit, while the resources of Odessa could be sent to California Base in order to produce more weapons and mobile suits on Earth. While the Earth Federation fought the advancing Xeon forces to the best of their abilities, they were often met with horrific losses. There were some limited successes with the Earth Federation focusing on mass tank formations, ambush tactics, and even the capture of Xeon mobile suits, but these efforts did little to stem the Xeon forces. During the conquest of Earth, Xeon had been working on a number of other projects. By June, they had completed a series of defenses in space. This consisted of two asteroid fortresses, a Bauaku and Solomon, as well as the Granada lunar base. They had also begun development of a weapon they had deemed mobile armor, which was intended to be a larger variant of the mobile suit, intended for heavier or more specialized weaponry. In addition, they had founded the Flanagan Institute, an organization dedicated to investigating new types. Xeon believed there were individuals who had some kind of advanced abilities that could make for powerful soldiers. The Flanagan Institute was focused on finding and developing these individuals. By September, the Earth Federation navies on Earth had been soundly eliminated, and the vast majority of the Earth was under Xeon control. It seemed that the Earth Federation was at its limit. It had been completely defeated in space, and now Xeon forces controlled the majority of the Earth. While the Earth Federation still had control of their headquarters in Jabro, including the manufacturing and development labs there, as well as their base on Luna 2, they had little to strike back at the Xeon forces with. They had to bide their time and wait for Operation V to bear fruit. So as we discussed today, the beginning of the One Year War was a horrifying experience for everyone involved. The Earth Federation saw the lengths Xeon was prepared to go to in order to win this war, while Xeon saw that they would not be able to topple the Earth Federation as easily as they'd believed. Even after 30% of humanity had died, the war still continued, and neither side was prepared to back down. I think that's all the time we have for today's class. Next class, we'll go over the Federation's Operation V, as well as what this would mean for the face of mobile suit warfare. If you have any questions or comments about today's lecture, please send them to fictionalhistory101 at gmail.com, and I'd be happy to address them in a future class. Until next time, I'm Aaron Johnson, and don't forget to study.
Thank you for listening to episode 2 of Fictional History 101. Please make sure to subscribe and leave a review if you can. I've been having a great time making these, and I'd love to know if if anyone else is having a good time listening to these. Thanks again for listening, and I hope to see you again next class.